So what I'm going to talk today is about fractures of the third metacarpal metatarsal bone. I think these are um, difficult fractures. Um, and what I'm going to do is I don't have title slides. I have a one or two title slides that I will use. The rest, uh, I show you just slides. And I'm going to talk to it. And um, so I show you a, a, a lot of radiographs. And um, when, what, obviously, if we talk about cannabone fractures or fractures of the third metacarpal bone, metatarsal bone, there are the fractures of the um, of the cannabone. Let me get this. Of the whole cannabone, that's one part. The next one would be condylar fractures. Then there will be some splint bone fractures that's still the same area and then as the last one will be sp um, sh um, park chains or stress fractures now for today because the time is short i'm tr i'm mainly talking about or i just talk about these fractures uh, if needed we can always add maybe another lecture at another time no problem all but today we just concentrate on this now, when I talk to you, and I mentioned that the other day, they had the same slide. When I talked um, last day with, um, with Argentinian and Latin Americans on electronon fractures, <coughs> please, when you look at a radiograph, do in your mind the classification. Because when you ever want to ask advice from somebody, on a telephone, on a radiograph, that um, I'm going to get advice what to do, I think what you need to be able to tell them is, well, is it a simple fracture or a comminuted fracture? Well, what you're seeing here is we obviously have comminution. There are little fragments right here. So we have a comminuted or multi-fragment fracture. The next point would be is it displaced or is it not displaced? Again, it's easy to see this. It's pretty far displaced. It's actually overlapping. So it is displaced. There is no bone-to-bone -bone contact at the fracture end. So that's um, mainly displaced. The next point would be, is it open or closed? Well, when you have the case, you can a lot of times see whether the fracture is open because you have a wound. Uh, on the radiographs, on the other hand, if it is open, we can see um, that we have gas bubbles in it. Like here, we have a few little gas bubbles up there. So it is also penetrating the skin here. This is the cast or the splint. So yes, we have a displaced fracture here. And then the other point does it have articular involvement or physial involvement is another point to kind of think about. It. So do this in your mind silently. I'm not going to do a test and quiz you what, what it is, but it's a good, a good exercise for you to kind of do it when you see the fracture. <coughs> for the first few, I will help you with it or I will do it so, to, so you can confirm it. And that, that towards the later ones, it's not necessary anymore. Now, as we look at this um, fracture, this horse lived 15 miles from, or maybe 24 kilometers from the vet school. It belonged to the brother of, our, of one of our um, surgery nurses. So he had the horse, he saw he had a fracture, put it in his trailer and drove right away to the clinic without doing anything. He did not want to lose time was his point when he came to us. Now what I want you to do is look at this horse. Look at his eyes. This horse is suffering tremendously just leaning against the wall of the, the big cattle trailer. It is grossly sweaty, completely wet. 
Then you look down here at the leg. And this leg is just held by the tendons in the back and by a little bit of skin. Most likely the major vessels to the distal part of the foot are clogged up. So even if you could fix it, it would not be get any blood supply anymore because those vessels are blocked and we wouldn't do anything, I guess. Now, then I want you to, to look at a few other things. Look here. You can see the street. Okay? So it's, it's a trailer in very, very good shape. And then back here, you see ropes. Now, I don't have time, there will be another lecture, to talk about first aid and transportation uh, of a fracture patient. But what it is definitely not is this way. The horse should have some, some things to lean on on both sides and so on. So the owner wanted me to treat it. And this is what I did. I treated it immediately. I put it to sleep. This horse had suffered enough. Just an, you anesthetized it or uh, you sanitized it right here. Now I see here the trailer. There's even some blood here uh, of it that he may have gotten back there. Or maybe I may hurt his other foot, blood all over the place. So this is the best thing we could do for this horse. Because first of all, the fracture would never have healed, despite the fact that it was within six hours, but it was so grossly contaminated because the horse with the rest of his cannon bone, he got down here. And you can see a lot of times when he went down there. And you can also imagine that this uh, owner did not drive 15 kilometers an hour to get to the clinic. And I bet there were some red lights, stop lights in between where I had to do a sudden stop. So, to start this, this is definitely not what we want to do and what we, how we want to treat this part. Just another part of a thing, if you want to do a bandage, you should cover the fracture. Now this I have to admit that this was a horse that had not really, you could not see a fracture. That's what the owner told me when he talked about the horse. And he said, well, it's just very lame. It's fracture lame, but I don't see a fracture. So he just thought it was maybe P1 and put a cast on up to here. You can see the swelling here and obviously the fracture, which was initially non-displaced, and maybe just the green stick fracture, is now a complete fracture. But it's still a closed fracture, it's a simple fracture, and it's partially displaced. But we still have some bone-on-bone -bone contact right here. So not a good bandit for the transport. Here is another fracture. Now this one is an incomplete fracture, non-displaced, non-articular, and closed. No physis in one. Now, this is the way the horse was sent to the clinic. This is the proper way. We want to have the splint to go down to the floor, go so covering the joint here below the fracture covering all the joints above the fracture and going up to the lateral part of the elbow. So this horse has a good support. Maybe it has too much padding on, a little bit less padding would be better, but especially in the cannon bone, because with the movement and with the work, loading and unloading the horses will compact the, the cotton which was placed on the skin and was then uh, tightened with elastic elastic bandage, but so it will kind of get more dense in it, which made the fixation a little bit less solid. I got these slides and many of them from Dr. Ruggles um, from Kentucky. I, I think it is um, 
But this is the proper way to transport a fractured hole or a horse with a fracture of a cannon bone to a clinic. And afterwards, if it's done like this, the surgeons there have a chance to do something good. If you do a bad job, all your bandaging was worth nothing. And because the surgeons cannot really do a good job uh, with, the, with the horse, treat it properly and the horse has a chance to survive. Now, talking about management, can we do uh, non-surgical management? Yes, we can. The horse has good weight bearing, for example, like that foal on the, the, of the previous uh, fracture that was turned in. Uh, good weight bearing, good bone bone on bone contact, no displacement there. Uh, we can put a cast on very easily. But again, we have to put it from top to bottom. This is the size cast we need. So what we have to do is maybe every two weeks, definitely after two weeks and after four weeks, take radiographs. That increases cost. And then later. Another point is, all of it, the horse gets all of the, the, the animal gets all of a sudden lame or more lame. If you can palpate heat over the fracture, if the smell is, there's a bad smell from the cat. These are not good signs. If this happens, what we have to do is change the cast. So with every, to change the cast, most likely we have to put the horse under anesthesia or the animal, pony, the foal, and in doing so, that increases the cost. So may, at the end, we even may have a um, bigger cost than if you go in and treat it with some implants. Another point to, to consider is because, as you can see, this donkey, it, the, it has a so-called tripod posture. It places this leg more under the ski, under the belly. So it's more in the median of the front part. And then he has these other two things and he just puts a little bit of weight here, doesn't put much weight, but major weight is here. Now, in an adult horse, that's not necessarily a big problem, but in foals, it will be a problem. And what's going to happen is, this leg is going to heal, it's going to be the good leg, and this one is going to be the bad leg. So keep that in mind, especially in foals, and always look also at the, the um, opposite leg to see how the leg works, the leg, how the leg is. So, and if you have, if you see some signs, maybe you have to apply a splint on that leg too. That is possible. And then you cannot let them lay down. You have to put them maybe in a net or something like that. But just as a point is, yes, it is possible that we can do um, um, conservative treatment um, and not do a surgery. There are less risks, no question, especially there's a lesser risk of infection compared to opening the fracture, but complications are here. A non-union, fragment displacement, uh, angle the limb deformity in the opposite leg and folds, and obviously laminitis. These can happen. And we have to take into account so let's look at one of those folds again, what we're having here. Let's give you a minute to look at it. So we have a simple fracture. Well, actually we have a little, little bit of comminution right here, okay? But we really have to look hard to see it, call this a comminution. But if you want to be true to definition, we have a multi-fragment fracture because we have one fragment, two fragments, three fragments. That's multi, or is common. But we have a simple fracture. It goes basically from top to kind of here through that diagonal, comes the other way around. So it looks here almost like a circular thing. This is not 
an additional fraction. This is just how the, the fragments see when we look through the pole. Like this, just a one simple fracture. And it is non-displaced, it's non-articular. So that horse was placed, the foal was placed in a cast. And actually what we can see here, we have a little bit of displacement this way. So this is after two weeks. Now this is amazing. Yes, foal, if the condition, if their conditions are right, yes, they can respond very rapidly. Because most likely there, would, um, there was some bleeding underneath the periosteum. So what happened that 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 uh, that um, <coughs> hematoma stayed locally, and then because in in there there are growth factors, there are cytokines and all that, and they can help heal a fracture right away. So, but we do have signs that we have had instability because we have a callus here. We have some callus down here, almost ready to bridge completely. This one has just started to bridge. And in doing kind of, the callus always starts on, on solid bone. Keep that in mind. Callus cannot start here in the hole. It starts on solid bone on either side of the bone. So it lays up callus and in doing so, it decreases motion, side to side motion and front to back motion on these calluses because of these calluses. So by doing so, slowly it um, reduces the motion in the fracture at the fracture site. And once that thing is bridged over, then there is no more motion and this is just about done and after two weeks that's what we're saying you should see callus formation after two weeks um, so this is actually going the right way for uh, two weeks uh, is this and this is six weeks after the fracture and we almost have a complete remodeling of the fracture side you can see just a minor little callus you can see here is much more pronounced but it's still okay it's still gonna go through remodeling but we have a very very good solid um, primary bone or no secondary bone healing within six weeks but what we can see if we look at the first slide here look at the density of the bone and look at the density here after six weeks in a cast if we have osteoporosis, no question about it. But this, once the horse can start putting weight again, now he can just put a bandage on maybe for two weeks and then go ahead, start hand walking him, putting him in a small paddock, then on pasture, and it will be again very solid. It will re uh, calcify in the calcium. Here we have another fold, and here we have again a um, simple fracture, and it is Salter Harris type 2 fracture. We have a fracture going through the metaphysis, this metaphysis, and then through the physis. Non displaced. It is a physical contact, physical component, no articular component. Now, treatment of these is basically we used to try to put plates on, but if you put a plate on, you have to go from here all the way down up here. You have to kind of bridge the physis. And then sometimes this is opening it up and um, not a good sign so a very simple technique is you can go ahead with just two lag screws across here one here and one here as we can see here 
this is out of the, of the surgery, surgery reference, the online fracture manual that is on the home page of the AO vet, uh, which is part of the AO foundation. We can put two, the, two, these, two of these screws in lag screws across, over drill, and then on the opposite, we're going to put a tension band with two, one screw in the physis, one screw in the metaphysis, and then co uh, cover it with a figure eight wire. Simply done, easy to do. And here we have a clinical case where we did it a little bit different. We just used two tension bands. One on the fracture side, that's where the fracture is. And this is a little bit post up, but we have a very nice healing um, going on, no displacement, and pretty quick the implants can go out. Because the one thing we have to keep in mind, if a physis, physis is involved, these, the healing goes much faster. So within a month, I think they can be removed. But this is a very elegant, simple treatment not many implants, and you can imagine once we start using plates, we need more screws and the treatment becomes more expensive. The screws are not expensive, the wire is not expensive. So when we do a fracture treatment, most of the time, place the animal in lateral recumbency, it is possible to do it in dorsal recumbency, no question, then you have access from two sides, but one side is actually pretty good. Do it ladder recumbency, then do the proper draping, fix it, and then we approach the bone um, dependent where the fracture is. If you do an open reduction, we're just going to go either between the lateral and the common digital extensor tendon. The other way would be to split the long digital or extensor tendon or the common digital extensor tendon in the front leg or the lateral digital extensor tendon, whatever. The reason for this is that afterwards we leave all the um, subcutaneous tissue intact, goes split the tendon and open the fracture underneath it because this allows us afterwards to have the tendons, we can do the uh, split tendon we can suture, and that gives a solid fixation. If we just try to suture the, sub, the um, subcutaneous tissues, the problem there is because when we put plates under this fracture, it's going to be thicker. And we're going to have a lot of tension on the subcutaneous tissue. And if it is cut, we can hardly get it together. But we can get it together if we split the tendon and we just suture the um, the tendons, and the whole thing will stay intact and will not rupture. Another point we have to look at, if you have an open fracture, we have a wound, we should definitely not go to our fracture like this. We need to go away from the wound. Also, what we need to do first is, because we have to assume that <coughs> the wound goes down to the bone. So what we need to do is take a simple uh, surgery pack, um, not many implants, just a knife, scissors, um, some Kelly's needle holder, and then uh, and um, scalpel blade, and then we're going to debride that pack, that area, debride it, clean it, and go ahead. Um, just and afterwards, we cover that part, go to the next point, change the instruments, get new instruments in there, and we also lavage that area, clean it out properly, go to the next point, get a new, uh, new set of instruments, and then go ahead and do our approach to the fracture where we plan on doing it. Now I'll go simply through some technique of applying the plate. Basically, if we have a chance, we should try to get the fractures together if it's not a common fracture. Or at least get the main fragments together so it's afterwards easier to put on the plate. We also need to plan ahead of time where we want to put 
the plates. So we go to a spot where we're not gonna put, we're not gonna place a plate and put uh, two lag screws across, um, ideally 3.5 millimeter screws, they make smaller holes. And if we countersink the head, sometimes we can, it can be flush with the bone and we can even place a plate over it well, without causing, causing undue pressure on there. Then we start to apply a plate um, and it's important because they're relatively long plate, 12 hole plates or so. What we want to do also now, if we use the locking head plates, and this is um, LCDCP here, but it, if we want to go ahead and apply screws towards the end of the bone. So we know the whole plate is on the bone. We're not going to tighten the first screw until we have the second one in, and then we can go ahead and tighten it. I don't think it is important to go ahead and apply um, axial compression, especially with the locking head plates. It's not important anymore because they are solid and they're not going to give anything. Because what we, what we do if we put um, axial compression that we place the screws at the far end of the hole on either side and then go ahead where we're tightening, we put compression uh, in this direction. If we do this and we have a minimal fixation with, um, with our screws, we may actually, and there is in full especially, and not, it's not much cortex, we can go ahead and we kind of ruin or we kind of break down our um, interfragmentary fragmentary compression we had initially. So just put them in in neutral at that point. But also it is important, so we know the plate is on the bone when we put that thing on. This is especially important when we use locking head screws. First put cortex screws in and then the locking head screws. And it is advisable to place two more right near the fracture. Then we go ahead and put a second hole screw plate on. Again, the same thing. First put on the cortex screws on either end. We can then also put a locking head screw here and a locking head screw here. Uh, also in this one. So we want to kind of when we, have, when we can also fill all the holes. Now, when if we think it is critical that we put a screw through here, what we can do, we can remove these two screws once we have the first plate in place. And then we can just add our screws uh, where we want to. However, what we need to do is we need to be careful that we go ahead when we plan our screws, that we plan them away from the locking head screws. Because keep in mind, the locking head screws can only perpendicular to the long axis of the bone or to the long axis of the plate. They have to be there. See, this screw here is totally, totally wrong. This is at an angle. This screw does nothing. We should have planned ahead of time. This is a bad screw because that's not gonna hold. Might as well put a cortex screw in because this screw doesn't do anything. And instead of doing a locking head screw here, doing a locking head screw here. But here we can go perpendicular. This one doesn't do anything. That's bad. So we tighten them all, put additional screws in, and now we have them in, and the, the, the thing is fixed. Then we can go ahead and suture our tendon, either combine the lateral tendon uh, with the common or the long, or we do this. Um, the splitting of the tendon. Now, if the fracture is not displaced, we can try to do it minimally invasively. Basically the same thing what we're doing, get our first screws in, then go ahead and apply, make a small stab incision here, and then use the pointed end 
of the plate, not at the blunt end, uh, pre-bend the plate, and we do the pre-bending by taking an x-ray. If the fracture is non-displaced, just looking at the x-ray, and then go ahead and bend the plate, and then compare it, lay it, kind of, not lay it right on the, um, we can do it, lay it right on the radiograph and see whether it fits, and then go ahead and sterilize the plate again so we're ready the next day and make the incision at the appropriate place. If you have um, fluoroscopy, this is definitely helpful. You can see how you, where you end it up, push it up there. Here we don't have screws in. That can be done now still. Try to get here into fragmentary compression, but this can be done. Then again, we place our um, screws to the second last um, hole in the plate on the top and on the bottom and then two, two near here again always looking that we can get our locking head screws in to a second plate and then what we can do place an identical plate over the plate because we can see our our screw heads here through that hole we can go ahead and then make our stab incisions right over the um, hole down here. So we can just make, get that locking head screw in through a stab incision. And here we get a cross. Here we have one here and we have one here. But they get a cross. We can do that. That's well planned. We're doing good at this one. And then put all the screws in, tighten them up and then we're done. And this is how it looks in a clinical case with the stab incisions. So we can go ahead and now put a bandage on and make some, put the suture into each of these things. The long one, maybe a couple of sutures, just subcutaneous sutures, not, no big deal, and then put them in a splint. So again, this is the fracture we talked about before. Um, got it a little closer together by manipulation. And so what are we going to do in this case? Again, it's a non, it's a minimal. Any problem? No, sorry. Okay. So a, a minimally displaced fracture, simple, non-comminuted, non-articular, non-open. So this is fracture, how it was treated. I think it was in the times when we didn't have the um, locking head screws, it was DCPs, two DCPs, and they followed the principles. We want to cover the entire bone from epiphysis to epiphysis, or just about, okay? So we, we can do that either with one plate and then add a second plate, a shorter one, or we can add a, an identical long plate, but it's not necessary as long as we have this part covered uh, in with two plates at 90 degree angles relative to each other. So we can save so a short, use a shorter plate and a thing and uh, less screws but one plate covers the entire bone. That is important. If we would stop both plates right here, very easily, we will get a fracture through one of those screw holes right here at the end of the plate. And that, not, that, that is not helpful. Here are two other things. Um, this is immediately post-op. This is a little bit later. We had to make another incision here to check something out. So there we have three more staples. Another point, we do not staple the skin wound anymore. The reason for this is that we want to have, uh, we get easier infection with the staples. So it's much better to use non-metal in the skin and we can keep it clean and uh, we can reduce the infection rate like this. Because keep in mind, the wounds have been open quite a, a long time 
there's a couple hours, three hours until we have all these screws in and the whole thing reduced. So this is important that we don't have metal then also in the skin. And that went out fine to heal. Again, we've seen this fracture before. <coughs> Not incomplete, non-displaced, simple fracture, non-articular, both. This was treated now with two plates. Two. This is an intraoperative radiograph, again, courtesy Dr. Al Ruggles. And we have, so we want to see, is uh, the plate, are the plates on correctly? And you can see we're right here at the physis, so we're not going to jeopardize the physis if we're going to put a screw here. We're not going to be um, causing any damage here, but we're almost at the top of the plate right up here too. So we're in good shape. Here is the fracture, and the fracture area is uh, covered with two plates. So then we finished the surgery. We did, they did it through one incision, as you can see. So kind of open up the wound to either side. And what did they used again to save money? They used an L, an LCP as the main plate, a broad one, and then a narrow DCP. Now what you have to keep in mind is the LCPs, the plates are not the expensive part. The screws are the expensive part. And to save more money, what we can do is and you see in this case intraoperatively they had the screws, the cortex screws which were less expensive here in this in the smaller plate yet and one screw here to kind of press the plate down to the bone, and then they put two, two locking head screws on either side of the fracture, one here, and see, here is one is here, and one is here. No, one is here too. Two locking head screws towards the end, and the rest, they can be simple cortex screw because these two screws they do the trick and they hold the plate solidly, no movement at all. And because it is a foal, a young foal, this is ample. And we can, it's not going to be that expensive. We can reduce some money, um, um, 40 owners in that case. Another case, a uh, very long oblique fracture. Here we have an, inc an incomplete fracture, just a a fissure fracture along the bone, and here we have a um, simple fracture displaced. But because of this part, we also have a fraction fragment here. Uh, we have to look at it as a comminuted fracture in this case. A young foal again, cannon bone, and intraoperative shots just put two screws, um, interfragmentary screws through the fracture to stabilize it um, on either side of the plate. And then we apply the plate and in the plate, we have again, this screw here is uh, going oblique across the fracture and does some interfragmentary compression again. So we have additional screws that go through and this is how the, how the whole thing looks at the end, that one plate and again, just about could have used maybe one screw, one screw more up here, or two screws more. That would have been ideal um, to cover the entire bone with the plate. But we are close to it. We're in the me proximal metaphysis. Uh, we were okay, and I think we did fine. Now this is um, a radiograph I received from a Latin American friend or Central American friend, Carlos uh, Villalobos. He sent me those radiographs and he did that fracture. Uh, as we can see, we have a slightly displaced fracture, simple fracture here, but we have fragment, fragment lines here. We have another one 
it is basically a long spiral fracture that fractured all the way through. And we do have some displacement, but it is a closed fracture. Now, what he did, he went ahead and did put some screws in, and he's um, got a, put a, a lag screw down here, he put one here. He tried to put one here, but was not happy with it. We left it alone, tried to do the same thing here. We also have a splint bone fracture at the same time here, but you could get it together very nicely with lag screws, and then he applied a narrow locking compression plate over the fracture. Could have down here is fine, right at the epiphysis. Ideally here, you would have used three more screws. But maybe here and maybe here. That would have been better to kind of prevent a fracture. But he put it in this big long splint, and this is the fold of some time after a bandage change. What he also did, he incorporated the hawk here. They gave him a little bit a longer leverage arm without going all the way down up here. And that helped them also give a little bit more support for the um, fractures of external support on that. And this is now after six weeks, we have callus coming on, there's callus forming. We're not quite there yet. No, I think it's after two weeks, sorry. We, we have callus here. Callus is start moving on this end, on this end, but we're doing we're in good shape. It's what we'd like to see. If you look at, compare this one with the area here, this is pretty regular compared to here and here. But here, the whole thing, in this area, is much denser. And this tells us that we have a lot of bone, no bone formation going on, and bone uh, uh, recruitment in the fracture area. And this is a good sign. So we are almost halfway there for the healed fracture. Um, I don't have another case in this, this one, but it did do very, very well. Now, here we have a fracture. Now, if you look at this, this is a displaced fracture. It's a multi-fragment fracture. See here a fragment, here a fragment. We have displacement. We have a fragment down here that fell down here. We have also a fragment here, and we have an open fracture. This is a very young uh, thoroughbred foal, and um, we were at that point in a phase together with uh, the AO research thing to try new plates. This is the so-called PC fix. It is a plate that you put on unilaterally. You can see it here. You just have just one size of screws. And the hole is conical here, where it goes a little bit in like that. The screws are conical, and the screws are locking in the hole. If I put them in absolutely perpendicular, what I did here, you should not see the screw head here. You can see a little bit of the screw head that tells me I was a little bit oblique. So that's um, here again, here again. The other ones were just about fine. In this area, didn't do it. Now I applied the plate over the um, periosteum because we have only one point where it makes contact with the bone. This is the only point where it makes contact with the periosteum. In this region, doesn't make any contact. So the, the periosteum is intact. We don't have to loosen it up, which this helps also with, with bone healing. Now, the drawback is that I didn't do a good reduction. I, I have it too much bent here. 
So if you can see the bone going from here to here, if here we have see, have one fragment protruding. This should go. This should be all like here. This is how it should be. But this is the only problem we have. We have titanium plates, and we were hoping that we could prevent uh, infection from occurring. Well, after two weeks, infection was starting. We have some new bone, um, some bone density going on here. It's something going on. Try to do something, but we have we have seepage through the thing. So what we had to do is we laid the horse on the table and we did, and did some lavage of the thing, uh, opened it up, checked it out, and we lavaged the area and then closed it up again daily for several days. What we should have done also would apply, and we do that nowadays, that we would use um, PMMA beads impregnated with um, chanamycin <coughs> or amicacin or anything like that. We would have them right down to the bone to, to, to try to prevent infection. And these plates were actually precursors of the locking head screw. This was the, the, the one that was preceding it. Then came the um, actually the locking head screws where they made the round holes in the plate. Just to show you about this. Now what we found, and this is after a month, we can see the dates up here, we see we have a little bit displacement. If we compare it to this point, this one, there we got a little bit displacement. So what we did two days later, we added a screw, a lag screw, kind of across this part, to lock it to the other side, did that through a screw, uh, uh, a stab incision to get a little bit more solid fixation. And then after a one, an additional month or two months after the fixation, we have healing everywhere in this area. This healed nicely. We have callus formation and remodeling and we're doing good. And um, after another two weeks, we removed eventually the plate at this point of time. And the horse actually went on to, to race and he won one race. Maybe it was a handicap Olympics that he was participating, but he won a race and at least we could save him for that. He went afterwards into stud. So this is how it looked to um, basically two weeks later, we removed the plates and we had that uh, lag screw uh, we had to remove afterwards because it broke. Uh, we had some movement in that area. Another case you can see, very early case, if you look at that age, um, open fracture, simple um, fracture, uh, sli slightly displaced, open, no articular displacement um, involvement. We applied, we did a lot of flushing. We have an ingress, ingress drain. We have an egress drain. And we put a um, 10 hole plate um, on there, five screws above, five below. And uh, with the plate, put them in a splint and went on uh, the horse again. Where we got an infection. We had to flush it again, uh, over and over again. At nine weeks, we have quite some lucency at the fracture site. There is a little bit of more density on these two sides, so something is going on here, but we do not have any callus formation in these two areas. We, again, here we have like a gap. This is a sign of infection. We have a little bit of callus here and here, so we kept on going. The foal was putting some weight on the leg. The other leg was okay. And finally, after five months, we had healing of the fracture. We had callus formation raging, and that uh, was not quite 
um, remodeled their callus. So waited another month. At that point, the callus was remodeled. We removed it uh, again, cured everything. And at that point, we still had some drainage at five months. Because once we have that plate in, the plate, it's gonna drain. If the infection is around the plate, uh, under the plate, and it only uh, remo removes, okay, kind of resolves once we get rid of the metal. We could get rid of the infection in the titanium plate, the case before. Left infection, that did not drain anymore after about two months. But um, that was a titanium plate. And that is basically, titanium is looked at upon as being like part of the body. It's not a foreign body, like a, a stainless steel plate is. Now, let's go to some adult cases. Now, as you can see, in folds, we have a much better chance because the weight is not as big, but we have a much better chance than in the adults. Now here, we have in an adult, here we have an incomplete fracture going through here. We have an undisplaced fracture. We have a closed fracture, but we have a ticular involvement. So this is the fixation we did. And I was part of the surgeons. Now, look at that fracture. Are you happy with the fixation we did? Let's look at it. I, I guess you say the same thing I did. This screw is fine because of nice contact with the bone, with the, the uh, screw head, head, the screw head, but down here we don't have we have, don't have contact with the bone. That is uh, just not um, a good screw. Because, but the screw was solidly tight, and if it, it twisted it more, we would have twisted off the head. But what did we wrong? Well, we did drilling. You can see it here of the back cortex, but we didn't tap it all the way through. And these are not self-tapping screws, so we could not get it in. And we simply, if we would have um, tapped it a little more on both of these areas, we would have been okay. And we could enter the screw all the way. Uh, so this is um, a week after the surgery. We kept on going. The horse was not doing badly, it was a little bit lame. And now we see there is some fracture healing going on either side. And this is now two months after the surgery. But we have something going on, remodeling going on in this area. And then um, this is three months, almost three months after the surgery. And now we can, this fracture line down here is almost completely obliterated. And here the fracture is healed, despite our bad job that we did. So sometimes we can be lucky. Now this is a little bit more complicated case. And uh, I'm not going to do the classification here because you can, I think you can do it yourself and see what we have. And yes, we do have an open fracture. That now, this is the fixation. We have a broad plate, now two narrow plates on from the top to the bottom, one and one a little bit shorter, staggering the plates, that's fine. We have some locking head, it's a so-called hybrid fixation because we have some um, <coughs> some cortical screws and some uh, locking head screws, but the fracture looks good. Eventually we could remove the plate, pushed it very nicely, nice little bit of callus. We have left that one black screw in there, one screw broke, and we couldn't get that out because this screw is pretty much incorporated into the, the bone. And actually, 
um, this, this is the horse, and the owner could go on. She was so happy that she published an article about it, and uh, she could go on into dressage and was very happy with her horse. But nice things happen. Now, sometimes when we look at metaphysical, metaphysical fracture, uh, the distal metaphysis or the proximal one, we'd like to have some more, some stronger implants. And we have options. One of them is a DCS. This is, this screw is 11, 12.5 millimeter wide. Here, that barrel, and here, the screws are 12.5 millimeters wide, and the plate is thicker than a cortic, uh, than a regular plate. So this is a very solid fixation in the distal fragment. The other one, which we use lately, uh, which is a little more expensive, but we have more options. And this is the distal femoral plate, where we can put five screws up here in the screw head, or six quite multiple screws you can see them at at different angles and what we did in this case to get a little bit more bone here is because this joint is a stiff joint it it, it doesn't move we also used the distal row of carpal bones and um, as part of the proximal fragment so we could get more screws in the proximal fragment Oops which is a solid fixation, and it turned out pretty nicely. A similar fracture like before, and this one is, <coughs> this is so-called NMC. That means not my case. But I got the radiographs from the clinic, and what they did is, they used the locking head plate, a narrow one. They went all the way. This is actually a pony. That's why they got away with it. And what they did is they put circlage wire around here. Why? I didn't know. Because easily you can put screws in here. Uh, maybe not a locking head, but you can get a screw here. You can definitely get a locking head screw here. You can get a locking head screw here. And maybe even here. This is not a problem in this case because it's a simple fracture. And f from that point, um, but they, they went ahead, they did it. This is, um, and this is how the fracture healed. This was three months down the road and lo and behold, the fracture went on to heal very nicely. Yes, we have a little bit of callus formation, uh, also up here to some extent, uh, but not the problem. And the fact is, if you look at, at this bone here, and you look at here, we have much more bending here than here. But uh, could also be a little bit the orientation of the radiographic beams. But it went ahead and healed very nicely. Yes, we have a little bit of a problem down here, but the, but the pony didn't have to do much work and fracture that uh, was healed and did very nicely afterward. Now, this is a little complicated fracture. It could go actually into condylar fractures, but it's a distal metaphysical fracture because we have quite a few fragments here in this area. So it's a multi-fragment fracture of the distal condylus but otherwise, there is a lot of bone uh, solid all the way up here. So we did it somewhat um, kind of a little bit more extensive treatment of a condylar fracture. And this is put on one 3.5 screw across here. And then here, put a plate on um, and could kind of compress that fracture back there. We have good articular alignment, and this is the critical part, um, if we have articular involvement. And then the horse, five months post-op, it went on to heal. We, at that point, we removed the plate. And it is interesting, as you can see the holes. They did some remodeling around the holes, as you can see. But then three months later, took some more radi radiographs, 
and we still, the holes didn't fill in, but they remodeled. They were much more oblique and we see quite some callus going around and this callus is kind of offsetting the hole we have in the center. So this bone is, ex is exactly the same strength as it was before the fracture occurred. Interesting aspect. This is a very complicated distal fragment and we do have articular involvement, quite considerable one. Again, one of Dr. Alan Ruggles. Now they went ahead right away and did a bridging of, they did actually a fetlock arthrodesis at the same time with two locking head plates, just bridged the whole thing. And he went and did on fi very fine. This is after a month, horses do it very nicely and no problem at this point and it could serve as a broodmare. Another very comp, uh, comp uh, place in a kind of multi-fragment fracture in an adult horse, uh, in the canum, in the thing, hind leg, very nice job with two locking and screws, hybrid fixation. We have some, some cortex screws, we have some uh, locking head screws, we have they did both just fine. And this is the horse as it is in a, spling, in a, in a sling. Uh, they, these slings are very convenient because they prevent the horse from laying down. And by having some padding underneath, the horse can just lay down a little bit into the sling and rest the legs. And they're doing very nicely. They're accepting those slings. And um, after a while, they can be gone off. Now, this is a really extreme fracture. And I wouldn't know where to put on um, a plate on this one. It is a two-year-old, very expensive, warm blood stallion. So what I did at that point, I tried to do it with external coaptation, put in um, some transfixation pins, and then have put them in a, in a bar, which went around the foot. The problem here, uh, uh, and you can see it later on. So look, um, we obviously, we extended the leg a little bit, but we have quite some gaps. We have it, this uh, reduced the fracture to some extent. It's not as wide as it was here, uh, but nevertheless, um, we had them in that three Steinman pins. But what you can see, what happened is, within a few weeks, a couple weeks, the, um, the whole, um, the, the pins bent through. And if you look at the leg down here, it consolidated the fracture. It compressed all those fragments we can see here. So the problem actually we had is, we have too much working length between the bar and the, the bone. So what we should have done, just put on a cast and we would have been much older, it would have been on to, to this place and maybe we wouldn't have not sacked it. And the problem afterwards, so we had to reduce, change pins at that point and we had two, here were the old pins and we had to do this and after another two weeks, two of those pins broke and unfortunately, also, we have starting laminitis in this foot. So this was the end. But we had some, some bone remodeling going on. If we could have saved it for another month, we would have maybe been okay. Now, as far as we go, we have one case here, an early case. We did, we thought, a good job, applied two plates, broad, and a narrow on uh, one narrow on the cranial aspect. They bridged everything. We did everything right, but we never could get any healing going on. You can see here. This is after three months, no healing at all. We did once change the, the plates on this case. No healing at all. It still have a gap here. We have a little bit of new bone formation, a little bit of new bone formation, 
no bridging after three months. So we just had to say, look, this whole, this bone just doesn't want to heal. And we had to stop the surgery. And this, as you can see, is not an intraoperative surgery, an intraoperative view. This is obviously a post-mortem view. So to summarize it, what we talked about is, I think we can do a good job with fractures. We can heal quite a lot of them. We cannot heal all of them, so we don't have to put them all to sleep. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Auer. Let's see if you have some questions. Se alguém tiver alguma pergunta, quiser abrir o microfone e fazer diretamente ao professor Auer, pode ficar à vontade. Hi, André. Uh, how are you? It's Lucas here from Argentina. How are you doing, Dr. Auer? Uh, I well, just, thank you. I just have a, a, a short question. Um, do you always um, uh, routinely kind of elevate the periosteum um, before putting the plate against the bone if you're using a DCP or an LCDCP? Not anymore, if okay. I don't have to. Because uh, I don't think we, because the, the LCDCPs and the DCPs make only minimal contact with, um, with the, court, with the um, periosteum. And they have areas where they do not make contacts. That's why uh, I think we don't have to do it. What it definitely does, it helps you, maybe I do it on one plate uh, initially to be able to reduce it properly. Because remember what I showed you in the fall, if you're in there, if the, the periosteum all the way around and you go ahead and apply the plates, um, you may not get complete um, anatomic reduction of the fraction. That is still an important aspect. So if you do ahead, go ahead and maybe do it, uh, open it up at the fracture side and look at it, uh, that you have good reduction at the whole thing, good anatomic reduction. And then, um, then the rest, leave it on. I think that is better. Perfect. Because keep in mind, the external part of the core of the bone of the cortex of the cannon bone is uh, gets its vascular supply through the periosteum and if we take it all away then we don't have, we miss that when we know through a fracture the internal the, end, the endosteal uh, supply or the intermedullary supply is traumatized because the nutrient foramen in most cases is traumatized and the main um, nutrient artery inside the medullary cavity is definitely compromised, if not uh, vascular, uh, kind of ruptured. Perfect. So th thanks a lot for your clarification. So then you just incise the periosteum, but just to see if the anatomic reduction of the fracture is correct, not all along the extension of the plate. No, not necessary. Perfect. We I used to do it, but not necessary anymore especially with the locking compression plate, because they're solid. I appreciate it a lot. Obrigado, Andres. One point I want to make is, when you put in a locking head screw, you tighten it into the plate. So you know you're going to have a very solid plate. It has to be perpendicular into the locking head. That's good. But it's going to be either a solid feeling a screw even if you do not have any bone underneath the plate keep that in mind so just when you tighten the screw to, to these four newton meters or maybe even a little tighter wow, that's a good one that one is solid and, you, and you're not underneath the plate in bone you didn't do anything because the screw and the bone and the plate they don't need each other unless there is bone underneath. Did you get my point? Okay. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, sir. And there, there is a question in the chat. Diego? Diego, no quieres? 
a bar conductor Howard. Hello, do you hear me? Sí. Yes. Oh, okay, hello. How are you doing, Dr. Howard? Doing very well. Talking to you even better. <laughs> I have a, a question. Uh, when you show up this uh, picture where you uh, use a femoral plate for uh, the canon fracture and you also fix the distal row of the carpal bones, do you remember? Yes. Okay. You want to do see you, it? Yes. Do you, do you remove the cartilage just to make it easier to fuse everything? Uh, no, not necessary. Okay. Wait a minute, I'm too far. And it's a straight plate. I I no. only saw the the plates that they are curved. They capture plates. Here we go. Uh. I believe ah this one the thirteen I think it is. It's not here. Here, here. Oh, there you go. The twenty. Okay. Yeah. Just a moment. Yeah. There we go. No, we don't remove the cartilage because it doesn't matter what's happening okay. because we don't necessarily want to fuse it. We just need it for additional bone. If it's going to fuse because it's um, there is compression across, not a problem because all the movement is going to be here. Uh, all the movement is going to be I didn't do the pin. Now we had it. Here is the movement, and here is the movement. Well, thank you so much. Alguém mais tem alguma pergunta? Yeah, can I ask a question, Professor? It's not. Technique, not exactly, but I want to know in horses above 10 years old if you have seen some correlation between like metabolic disease or endocrine disease like PPID and occurrence fractures. So I don't, what is, I don't get your question right away. Do you think an older horse doesn't heal as well or what? Yeah, uh, like he not healing or getting more tendons to fractured bones when they have this kind of disease, like met metabolic disease or some endocrine disease. I don't think we have to worry about metabolic disease. Hardly ever do we have that. And the bone, you know, the horse's bone are, are very strong. I don't think we have to worry about that. And please keep in mind, they're, they're moving around. They're going around. Maybe Cushing disease may be the only thing, but then they have other problems. But, you know, an older horse can, they, they may break the legs mainly because of a kicking injury, you know? If another horse kicks it, that's a, that's a problem or a bad step or a bad thing. Things can happen in those areas. And um, most of the, the fractures we actually got at the University of Zurich were because of kicking injuries but from other horses. Because keep in mind around the cannon bone, there's hardly any padding. There's a little bit of skin, subcutaneous tissue, front and back, some tendons, but on the side, there is afterwards, it's just periosteum at the bone. But uh, so I, I, I wouldn't worry about that. No, I don't think metabolic things, but they can still heal. That's no problem. The bone metabolism still goes on. Unless you give them, laser, um, what do you call it? Uh, um, bisphosphonates. That's as most people who know me know, I'm 100% against 
is phosphonite. That's the worst drug that has been introduced to horses. Okay, thank you. Mais alguma pergunta? Go ahead, Mauro. Hey, Mauro. <laughs> I wouldn't go to eight. That's, that's, these are big holes. I think six would be the max. I haven't that much experience with it. In my hands, they're really... Um, I wasn't too happy with them. They didn't work in my hands. I know some people use them and they work just well. Interesting. Uh, so maybe I don't have an affinity to the external <laughs> to the, um, external um, the transfixation. Um, I'm I'm a plate and screw man. <laughs> <laughs> Mais alguma pergunta? A Mariana. Tem mais perguntas? Dr. Robert, thank you very much again for your attention. No problem, I enjoyed it. I, I hope I could provide you with some information. For sure. Obrigado a todos pela participação. Espero revê-los em breve de forma presencial, se Deus quiser. Um abraço e cuidem-se. Take care, Dr. Auer. Thank you very much.